Hello. Good to see you. It really is good to see you. Let, let's just uh, make much of Jesus today. It is a wonderful time to meet and to worship. Those of you who are coming in, being part uh, from far away or from behind a screen someplace, welcome to. If you are close enough, you know, you can get in the car and still make it. Uh, if not, you're not able to do that. Uh, we welcome you here just as well. We are looking forward to God doing a great move. Today is the last a sermon in a, in a kind of longer series on prayer. And if you have not been here uh, for, for them all or, or just uh, coming here for the first time, go to our website and, and find the others. Today we're going to look at, at the prayer uh, for the sake of glorifying God. And so um, I hope that you will have your Bibles ready in a little bit. I'm going to invite you to turn to Psalm 63. And if you're not quite sure where that is, just, you know, in the middle, right? You're going to land on the book of Psalms and then, you know, just find the, 30, the 63rd of those. You know, I wonder sometimes, you know, words are strange, right? You know, we all, all have words and we use them all the time. We don't think about them. They're just words. The word busy, you know, that's not a complicated word. It's not one that we think about a whole lot. But I, I just thought, I'm going to look that word up and see what is the background, the etymology of that word. And it's kind of interesting. It comes from an old German word that, that means that you're zeal zealously focused on one thing, that, that you are engaged singularly in one pursuit. And, and uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense in, in one way, right? We have a word called business. We all know what business is, but that has to, to do with doing things, right? And being engaged in certain kind of pursuits. And, and that is related to that word busy. So I mentioned that to say simply what we are going to uh, hear in, in this very psalm from David. You know, always... Think about what is another word for this here? Well, to be taken already, to be tied up with something that, that has your main focus. When the, when the phone calls, what do we say? Well, it's what? Busy. What happens when it's busy? You can't get through because the person you're trying to get through to is already dedicated singularly to another conversation, right? So at that point, you're just pretty much noise, and you get either you can hang up or you can get delegated to some kind of voicemail. I will get to you later. Are you hear what I'm saying? That's kind of what is going on here. That's the kind of busyness that that uh, characterizes. David, King David's relationship to God, his kind of engaged focus on this one thing. So the question I'm going to ask this morning, I had to ask myself this also as I was preparing this, how long has it been since you have been so busy in this sense with God that's so engaged that you have been unavailable to everything else. You try to just cram its way in to take your attention away. And all this stuff, noise that should just be relegated to voicemail. <clears throat> when I first <clears throat> came here to, uh, to study, to the U.S. to study, you know, everything was kind of new. Uh, I, I read, of course, read theology before I got here. So I knew words like sanctification and justification, ineffability of God, those kind of easy words. <laughs> but I had no idea. You know, I, I knew a couple of songs, right? I, I knew eagles enough to know if I stood on the corner, you know, I need to be careful with a flatbed truck coming up, right? I, I knew if I came to Texarkana, because I listened to CCR, that it was about a mile from Louisiana, which, by the way, is not true. <laughs> so I knew a little bit of that. But I had no idea that these kind of elongated, orange key kind of uh, roots were called carrots. Or green kind of thin things are called beans. So thank God for labels on cans, friends. You know, I knew the Danish words for that, in other words, but not. There are words, but not, not. 
the English word. So my next door neighbor was extraordinary, kind and generous, just a wonderful man. Helped us so much to figure out how, how things were going and how to, to kind of negotiate the many things that were going on. And so we were in student village, right? These itty bitty apartments that were just kind of on a row at seminary. And, and uh, I just went to the next door and knocked on his door and his wife opened the door. And, and I saw him sitting in there, you know, it's pretty much a room with a little room next to it. To, and he sat there with his back toward the door. And I said, can I talk to, let's just call him John. Uh, and uh, she said, he can't at the moment. And no, she could see my eyes going. <laughs> it's not that I can't see him. And she said, he's having his quiet time right now, but he would be right over when he's done and she closed the door. And I was walking back thinking, how could it be that John is more interested in talking to God than to me? <laughs> um, that was a real strong lesson. And it Talk to me a lot about what's going on here. David is teaching us about the importance of dedicating and focusing and being busy, if you will, in that sense, with God. In Psalm 63, that is that kind of a prayer. Uh, and some have said that that Psalm 63 is like the soul of, of all the Psalms, as if all the other Psalms were kind of contained in one way or another in that one Psalm. Chrysostom, one of the greatest preachers, if not the greatest preacher in the early church after the close of the canon, he said like this, he said, it is demanded that this Psalm is being sung every morning by the early Christians. Maybe you should try that. Maybe we should try that every single morning. as the first thing you ever do to sing this song or read this song here. Psalm 63. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I... <coughs> When I think of you as I lay on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I will follow, I follow close to you. Your right hand holds onto me. But those who intend to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by him will boast, for the mouth of liars will be shut. Friends, David sang this song or this psalm in the midst of the greatest difficulties ever of his life. I want you to see if you can even imagine that. If you can put yourself, just see if you can get into the story with your mind. Put yourself in his shoe. And don't think of his situation, but yours. And just look at this. It's pretty intense. Your own son had turned against you. And not only that, he had poisoned all your friends with untruthful accusations about you in order to win them to himself, and he had succeeded. After that, he kind of chased you out of your own home. He took your job, and he stole all your things. And you're thinking, 
Yeah, that's incredible. That, that seems impossible. And yet that is exactly what's going on here, right? Uh, Absalom, David's son, had turned a whole nation against David. He had chased him, uh, driven him out of his, his own palace, away from his own throne, stolen his court. And now, here he is alone. There's a history, you can read that. The background story for this psalm is found in, in 2 Samuel chapter 15. And it is indescribable almost in his scheming and in his poison. But that's where we find David. Abandoned, alone, in the desert with the prayer cry to God as his only option. And so what do we find? Busy, dedicated, occupied, exclusively looking at God. Here's a psalm, friends, and I, I would venture to say a psalm for a new time and, and a new kind of dedication, if you will, a new commitment Stripped for everything, David cries out to God, My soul thirsts for you. In this particular translation we have here, it just says, I thirst for you, but the original text actually highlights this, right? So it says, My soul thirsts for you, and my body faints or yearns in the strongest way for you praying to glorify God in the midst of the most incredible difficulties. And I want you to see in this text, because it's almost breathtaking, you can almost lose your breath, really, when you see the intensity and the passion that is here. God, you are my God. Not everything else, not anyone else, not all the stuff that I've had, not all the power that I've had. You are my God. And friends, that is where everything kind of begins. If you're fully busy, if I can use that word, you know now what, what I mean when I say that, right? But you're fully busy with God this way. You are always unshakably and Im immovably anchored to this very thing. You know, I look at that, and I'm trying to put myself in his shoes. How would I have prayed had that been me? Would it not have been the most natural if he had said, God, I, I, please give me back all my stuff. Everything that I have lost, you know that it has been untruthful whatever I have to said. You know that, that I don't deserve this. Please give me back my crown. Give me back my castle, my, my servants. Give me back my, my wealth, my, my friends, my power, my influence. Lord, give me back Jerusalem. Are you hearing this? Or we just say, well, you know, he's way too, too kind of dedicated to God, much more pious than that, well, then, you know, we would have said, Lord, grant your people a, a greater temple, even more priests that can sacrifice or give more sacrifices. What strikes me here, and what should strike all of us, I think, here, is, is that he is not asking for the things of God. He is simply saying, God, you are my God. When everything falls apart, you are my God. It's symbol, pulsating, life-empowering, vital prayer, not about the stuff of God, but about God himself. Lord, you are my God. Eagerly, or intensely as we could have translated that word, I seek you. How do we deal with things like that? 
You know, is there anything wrong with, with being captivated or focused on the things of God? Not necessarily if it's turned right, right? I mean, it's one thing just to ask for material stuff. And even that is not necessarily wrong. But God brings so many other things to be mentioned. His blessing will cover great marriages, strong homes, wonderful friends, joy, peace, more love, more power to be full of mercy, all of that. But friends, it is so easy to be more interested in the things of God, even in the blessings of God, than it is in being captivated by God himself. That's it. God, David is teaching us how to seek God. And he does so with an intensity. And it is as if he kind of pre kind of sits the word for Jesus even when he comes and he says, seek first the kingdom of God. And all the other stuff has come, but seek first God. You know, look at the intensity here. This is what, what kind of almost made me lose my breath when, when you sit in front of a text like this. You know, the, the, uh, the English translation, you know, everything has to be translated into another language, and there's never just a good one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing. And, uh, when you translate, but so the English translation is lacking some of the emphasis of intensity that are captured by the words used in Hebrew. The kind of the image you have uh, in the original text is that, that, that this is someone that barges in to God's throne room as he's sitting there with his counsel and, and just as if he could not wait, here's something that is so urgent that whatever he's doing otherwise, i got to get in and say this. There's an intensity and an eagerness for people that are zealously dedicated to glorifying God. And if we are to have the kind of impact and if our walk with God is going to have the kind of life-changing power that we talk about, this must be us. The Christians in our time, when I said this is a psalm for a new time and a new dedication, this is it. And if God is calling on you during this to come up and kneel or just sit with someone in the back and, and pray, don't hesitate. This is not just words, friends. We know we all go through all stuff. I'm, I'm talking to a large crowd here and, and, and a very large crowd also online, and I, I want to make sure that we hear this. We're not playing games. We're doing life, yes? So notice what's going on here. Eager, early, always, intensity in our desire to meet with God and him alone. You know, I want you to see, just to pay attention to the eagerness and the intensity of this language. My soul thirsts for you. My, my body yearns or even faints for you. David is in the desert and he's Comparing what is going on in his heart and in his soul and in, in his thinking with the land around him. The hunger of his body and, and everything around, he's looking at, at the dry ground of the desert and seeing these crevices and cracks that are crying out to heaven for, for rain, for moisture, only a meeting with the living God himself will bring the kind of wetness and the moisture and solace to his tormented soul. Refreshment. I don't know if you know Alexander McLaren. I doubt many of you will do. He's, he's considered one of the greatest uh, kind of preachers in the English-speaking world. Uh, he lived in, in the 1800s died 1910, if you will. 
He's saying this so strongly. He's saying this, and I'm quoting here. Uh, we are Christians in the measure and to the degree with which we know this kind of longing for God himself. Not just the longing for orthodox faith, although it is good to be orthodox in one's faith. Not just the longing after greater love to our, toward our fellow human being, although it is Christ-like to love your neighbor. Not just the longing for more activities in the church, although it is blessed to be active in the church. But we are Christians to the degree and in the measure that we have a longing for more of God. That's a powerful, powerful statement. But let me see if I can take a step even closer to this. And just see here, you kind of the biblical way, the Hebrew, Hebrew way, especially here, uh, body and soul simply points to the whole personality. It's not like they're two different aspects, or two di maybe two different aspects, but not two different separable parts. He's simply saying, everything within me, nothing in me is satisfied until I am fully dedicated to God, until I see him again, so to speak. In Psalm 84, he was saying even stronger here when he says, My soul yearns, even faints for the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Friends, I don't want to be saying things that just sound nice or poetic. It is the Psalms after all. There's a reality that lies behind that, right? And it just, David is saying that I can't find words that are strong enough for what I want to say about how much I need the assurance that God, you are my God, you need to hear it from my heart, all of me, my soul, my thought, my will, my emotion, my body, everything that is about me, desire this meeting with the living God. Praying to glorify God. You know, some of you may say, I am in the desert. That looked like David, but it nonetheless, there's no water. There's no shadow. There's no protection. Nowhere I can get under the shade and disappear. There's no life-giving power anyway. My life has just dried up. And David says, and I want you to hear this, he said, what I see around me is how I feel inside of me. Unless I get in contact with the living God, I will dry up and shrivel. And this is the promise, friends. This is where this imagery, this text is amazing. If you study even a little bit about the desert, you know good and well that when water suddenly kind of runs over the surface of the desert, new life can come in. Flowers can look as if they are dead and they all shrivel up and they, they are dried up and they have been there for years with no moisture and then water comes. And in an hour, they come back to life. Study it if you haven't studied it before. Just like that. That's the problem. That can happen to you, friends, even here, even in this service. Look at verse 2. We're going to stay with the text. It happens when you see God with this kind of zealous dedication in the sanctuary. I gaze on you in the sanctuary. <clears throat> we all need holy moments, sanctuary moments we're taken up. And if you say, yeah, I don't know about that. Did you see anything even this week on CBS where they had these mornings? You can find them on YouTube if you didn't see anything in the morning. 
It was incredulous. They had all these scientists and all these kind of psychologists, all these people who were, who were trying to say that it is now scientifically proven that people need these moments to survive. And of course, they want to disconnect God, so they came up with all kind of nonsense about putting their feet in the water, whatever have you. But the reality is this. We all need these moments. And look at it here. It goes all the way through in verse 6, right? I meditate you during the night, the watches of the night. I wonder what you think about when you can't go to sleep. Or even if you wake up in the middle of the night. A lot of people, just like David, he could have filled his, his nights with fear and with confusion. He was alone in the desert. I had to ask myself when I sat before this text, what do I think about if I wake up in the middle of the night praying to glorify God and to connect with the one true living God? Because you see, regardless of our circumstances, there's always a thousand reasons to praise God. David is praising God in the desert when he is chased out of his own kingdom. He's praising God for his compassion, for his protection. He's praising God for his love. Look here at verse 3. This is almost kind of unbelievable. He said, my lips will glorify you. Why? Because your faithful love is better than life itself. Think about David's situation. It's one thing to praise God when everything is great. Thank God life is good. It's quite another thing when everything has been taken away. But friends, prayer, I'm going to round up this whole series yeah, with this kind of emphasis, right? Prayer only becomes this tool for complete transformation of your life, more than mere words passing your lips. When you are able to, with David, in that moment of deep need to say, God, your faithful love is better than life itself, because even in life's best moment, stripped for that kind of power, it'll lose the very thing that brings color and beauty to everything else. I'm going to end by pointing to something that some could have missed if you just read through a psalm quickly. If you notice verse, verses 1 through 4, David is looking for God, seeking God, wanting God, asking for his presence. And then what did he say in verse 5? He has just switched. He says, you satisfy me with rich foods. David had met God, or let me rephrase that, God had met with David, and he had satisfied the longing of his soul. If I may mention another well-known British preacher, this time not a Baptist like Alexander McLaren was, but, but an Anglican. And some of you may even know him. He's written quite a number of books. He just died in 1984. Um, he gives his, he gives his uh, memoirs or, or you know, autobiography in a book entitled after this psalm. It's just called You Are My God. And in this book, he is telling about how he got saved and then how he got called and and then uh, after his, his uh, preparation, he, he went to a church in York where they put him, right? That's how it works in the state church system of the Anglican church. 
the city of York where he was uh, from, and there was a small little place, there were 10 people there, their weekly offering were two pounds, right? about three bucks. The church committee, they have such a thing uh, in the Anglican church for what they call redundant churches, buildings that are no longer able to sustain themselves, said in a year we're going to close this church. But God met this church. And their lives became completely busy with God, if I could still use that language, by dedicated exclusively wondering how did it mean if we just pursue God himself, not our own ideas, not our own desires, not what we like, not what we always done, just pursue God. What would that look like? And as this story goes, and just months after this, more people began to come. More people began, began to come. And in not too long after that, 700 people tried to press their way into this little church. And it became so much that David Watson had to go and ask in Yorkminster Cathedral. If you've been there, you'll know it is one of the most expansive and one of the greatest, most gorgeous cathedrals that you will find any place on the planet. And the church, the congregation, filled Yorkminster from 10 people and 2 pounds to a congregation that could fill up Yorkminster. Busy with God himself focusing on that. Can you imagine, friends, what would happen? You know, we need that, don't we? Alan needs this. North Texas needs this. Collin County. Imagine that this became such an obsession for us that we need to pursue God, God alone, and only him. And then all the other things would come. I don't even have words to conclude what that looks like. Other than to say, if each here and all of us here together would just say, let me just read the text for you. If we stood next, shoulder to shoulder, with David and cried out, friends, right here is a preparation even for the Lord's Supper. God, you're my God. I eagerly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. Lord, may these not just be words. May these not even just be words in our ears. May, them be, may they be your words. Not in a book, but in our hearts. Not just for inspiration, but for life transformation. Lord, you know each heart that is here, each family that is here, each single person that is here, each child, each adult, young, old, all of us. You know us as a congregation. Holy Spirit, speak as only you can. Make us ready and willing to say, God, 
You are my God. Eagerly, I seek you. Amen.